interested in the season pass for Who Killed Julie? Want to hear all seven episodes today? Head over to paulsading.com. Click on the shop button at the top of the page and look for the Who Killed Julie download. You get five and a half hours of this story with your purchase and you also help us begin funding the follow-on series to this story. Thank you for your support. Who Killed Julie is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is highly advised. This episode of Who Killed Julie is brought to you by my horror novel, 12 Deaths of Christmas. Available on Amazon for pre-order now. I think I'm going to tell him tomorrow. We're supposed to go over to the lake. I can't wait. I'm so tired of the guys being around. I just want a couple minutes with him. Just me and him. Yeah. I think I'm going to tell him I love him. He's going to think I'm crazy, but I don't care. I know it. I could love him forever. Julie's Journal, March 4th, 2001. Julie McLemore struggled to survive. She was a single woman, a single parent, trying to get through life in a world that didn't seem to care much for the struggles of the marginalized. Her life exemplified that struggle. It was a mirror held up for the world to stare into, to see their own ugly reflection looking back at them. Julie was the mother you pitied in the shoe store, the woman you wished would dress a little nicer for church, the mother you shook your head at, mumbling criticisms under your breath about how she should raise her kids better because they didn't know how to act in public. Yet, in the face of all this, she pressed on. She continued to work and sacrifice for her boys. She continued loving without really asking to be loved. Julie McLemore's story is the most beautiful tragedy you'll likely ever hear. This is Julie's story. This is the story of us. I am Emerald Johnson, and this is Who Killed Julie? In the summer of 1999, Walter McLemore walked out of his home to his 1994 Ford Mustang. It was a car Walter had worked years of his life away in order to afford. Don't be tempted to ridicule him. This isn't the story of some young father who starved his family so he could have a sexy car that would give him as many thrills as speeding tickets while attracting the eyes of equally young ladies. Not at all. This was the reward for a man who'd worked his adulthood away, driving beaters back and forth to the job or even sometimes taking Olympia's public transportation to get to work walking the intermediary distances between the bus stops and the points from which he was coming and going. Also, his family, his little girl, could have what they needed. No, this car was the reward for a man who'd given up a lot for others and was going to have a selfish moment in his life before the reality of a pending, most likely nasty divorce completely wrecked him. That day was hot, miserably hot. But that's all relative, isn't it? Hot in Olympia, Washington, isn't nearly what you'd consider hot in Alabama or Georgia. But to anyone who grew up in the area, this particular day would have registered right at the top of the misery scale. Walter McLemore remembered how hot that day was because this was the day he walked out on his family. It's the day Walter admits he'll still be thinking about right before he closes his eyes for the last time. It's the day he said he could never forget. I got a chance to talk to Walter about Julie. He didn't have a problem being on the podcast. Unlike just about everyone else I've spoken with, Walter was refreshingly open and honest. Now, grammar might not be a strong suit, but candor definitely was. I found him to be a very kind man. Soft-spoken, gentle, patient. Is it unprofessional for me to wonder what he ever saw in Julie's mother, Angelo? It was. 
It was the cutest thing in the world, but I realize that it's easy for me to say now, looking back on it all these years later. It wasn't so easy back then, but Julie was... She was so damn precious. Don't care how old she was. She... She was precious. She would have been, what, 16? Oh, something like that. It was 99, and she went off to New York in, um... 2001. Oh, you know your stuff. It's my job. Still, should know my own daughter's life better than you. Please, Walter, don't beat yourself up. This is my job, my only job right now, so it's kind of my duty to know everything about Julie's life. Even innocuous things like dates and years. Still, ain't easy for a father to hear a stranger. No offense. Knows more specifics about his daughter's life than he does. I don't know more. If I did, we wouldn't be chatting on the phone right now. (laughs) Fair enough. What did you want to know about my little girl? Are you okay talking about the divorce? (laughs) Yeah. Why? Just trying to get a feel for you. Everyone's different. Some people have no problem being asked anything, and others... Others can be a challenge to get an email address from. (laughs) I've got no secrets. Ask anything you want. But don't let me find out that you're insulting my little girl in this story of yours. Mr. McLemore... I promise, I'm only here to learn more about Julie. I'm not interested in making a scandal out of what happened to her. People don't know the truth. What do you mean? About her. How so? Well, everything I read in the papers, that wasn't her. Not my Julie, she wasn't like that. What was she like? She was my little girl, miss. Walter, whatever you need to tell me... I'm all ears. I want to learn about her. I'd love to hear your side of things. What's everyone else been saying? Does it matter? (laughs) I guess not. Well, she was smart. God darn smart. I used to joke with her mother that I wasn't sure Julie was mine, smart as she was. Angela didn't find that funny, though I was just joking. Damn, that kid did things in her life early, too. Put my accomplishments to shame. Like what? Oh, you name it, she did it. Everything in school. Grades, awards, teacher comments on report cards. Year in and year out, Julie was doing it. Never seen anything like that. I mean, I I wasn't a bum, wasn't lazy or anything like that. Pop would have beat that out of me if I was, but school just didn't come easy for me. And it did for her? Oh, yeah. With no effort. Now, don't get me wrong. Julie worked hard. Always worked hard. She wasn't never a slob. (laughs) I wish I knew how to work that hard when I was her age. Didn't happen, though. Wasn't that interested in school myself. But Julie? Julie loved school. Don't know where she got that from. She was one of them kids stay late after school asking teachers about the only question she missed on a test, begging the teacher to let her make it up so she could get a better grade. Teacher would be telling her it wouldn't do nothing for her overall grade, but Julie didn't care. Bothered her. Bothered her lots. Not to be perfect, you know. She was like that from the earliest I can remember. I mean, she never had a problem in grade school, but that was because she always had perfect grades. Perfect grades, perfect attendance. She got bullied a lot for it. I'm sorry. How long did it last, the bullying? Did it stop after elementary school? Kids are horrible to each other. You ever notice that? (laughs) Yes, they can be. So, Julie, she was bullied throughout school. You know... I'd have fully expected her mother to already told you about this. You talked to her mother, right? Yes. Hmm. Hmm. Still can't figure that woman out to save my life. Yeah, so Julie got bullied her entire life. When she was little, it'd be because of her grades and all them teachers liking her. When she got older, 
Well, she didn't, um, she was slow in developing. Puberty came late for her? Yeah. Kids were cruel as a Monday morning hangover, let me tell you. What kind of things did they do to her later? That stupid shit kids always be doing to each other. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I didn't mean to snap like that. Just ain't right what that little girl had to go through. I'm sorry, Mr. McLemore. If this is too painful... No, I ain't weak. I, I wasn't meaning to imply you were. No, I know you weren't. But I ain't kidding, miss. I want the real story of who my Julie was to come out. No more of this garbage everyone was reading after she was... after she was killed. Can you tell me about the bullying? How it affected her? Julie was a quiet girl. She learned that from a young age when she stood out from the rest of her classmates and they never let her forget it. Maybe it was a a defense thing. Defense mechanism? Yeah, one of them. She wasn't strong enough to stand up for herself, and that's our fault. We failed her, teaching her that girls ain't supposed to be lippy and garbage like that. Man, we was young and stupid. Got her mom pregnant right out of high school. We was nothing but a walking book of mistakes, and Julie paid the price. She always paid the price. You did well, Walter. She made it all the way to Syracuse. Got scholarships, right? (laughs) You know, I can still remember the day she got that letter. Danced around the kitchen forever. At least it felt like forever. Right up till she just had to call her girlfriend, she says. (laughs) She was shaking. Couldn't dial the phone numbers. She never hugged me as hard as she did that day. Even beat the day I left him. But yeah, she turned out all right. That was all her. Neither one of us had anything to do with it. She got there because she worked or took us off. Even through all the bullshit. Got picked on for the fact she wasn't becoming a lady as quickly as the other girls. Got picked on because we couldn't buy her the fanciest clothes. Got picked on because of her grades. You name it, miss, she was picked on for it. Spent a lot of nights up in her room crying when she didn't get asked to a dance or some damn party where those punks were boozing and drugging. Told her that's why she got into that university, because she stayed away from that mess. She'd always just smile and pat my hand and say, Okay, Dad. She knew better. She was smart like that. But she hit puberty before her junior year, right? Her yearbook picture is stunning. It seems to show Yeah, but that that didn't matter to those damn kids at school. She'd grown up with them. They always saw her as that broom handle thin girl with no chest. That's why I think she acted like she did when she got to Syracuse. What do you mean? Her, her growing up, filling out boys, giving her all sorts of attention and whatnot. None of that was a problem here, but sure as hell was when she got out east. Goddamn school. I ain't saying it was her fault or nothing. Wasn't even the school's fault, not when it happened the first time, but they Failed her, miss. Failed her bad. Want to talk about it? Have you talked to that boy from her school? Are, are you talking about Caleb Haskings? Yeah. Him. I haven't, no. But I'm calling him this week. Walter? Walter, are you there? Tell you what, miss. You talk to that son of a bitch, and then you and me will chat. Have a good day, miss. Sorry to be troubling you. Walter? Walter? Throughout this series of Who Killed Julie, we will be partnering with Safe Place in Olympia, Washington to raise funds for their operations. 
Safe Place provides crucial services to survivors of domestic and sexual violence. They offer a 24-hour helpline, 24-hour emergency shelter, and sexual assault response, advocacy support groups, legal clinics, children and youth programs, prevention education, community outreach, and training. Please see the donation link in the episode notes. Help us raise as much as we possibly can for Safe Place in Olympia, Washington, to serve people who need them now. Today, Olympia, Washington. Tomorrow, your city. Let's change the world. Walter McLemore had some unresolved rage. There's no argument about that. But I couldn't fault him. We're talking about his one and only kid, his little girl who went off to a school 3,000 miles away and came home a different person. In that first conversation, he didn't give me as much as I'd hoped about the divorce and the impact it had on the family, especially Julie. But, in fairness to him, he did let me know she'd been bullied basically her entire life, something I wasn't aware of before talking to him. That kind of stuff leaves marks on anyone it happens to. And it sounds like Julie's experience was no different. I wasn't done with Walter, not by a long shot. But then, after that first conversation, I wanted to respect his, can I call it a request, to talk to Caleb Haskings? I was already planning on interviewing Caleb since he seemed to be critical to this entire story. He was much more than a close friend with Julie, as you'll discover. At that point, I didn't have enough to go on to be so brazen as to make a specific claim, though. When I was working on this research, Caleb was living in Fresno, California, so it wasn't much trouble to fly down to see him. Plus, it's paid for, and it got me away from Olympia's reign. Miss Johnson? Yes, nice to meet you, Caleb. And please, call me Emerald. May I come in? Oh, yeah, uh, of course. Sorry. Thank you. Would, would you like some tea? Is that unsweetened? Afraid not. I could never get my taste buds around that. <laughs> I'll take a little bit, thanks. Are you okay to talk about Julie? Well, that's why you're here, isn't it? Yes. How long have you two known each other? Um... I'd say, well, since, uh, Syracuse. When was the first time you met her? <laughs> Hell if I remember. It had to be my sophomore, junior year, maybe. How did you meet? I thought you were swinging by to talk about Julie. We are. No, we're talking about me. Is that a problem? <clears throat> no, I guess not. Here. Thank you. Caleb, is there something wrong? Did I catch you at a bad time? <laughs> what? What is it? What is what? I don't know. You tell me. You're not really acting like someone who is happy to be bothered about all this. I came here thinking you were willing to talk about her. Yeah, well, you're not asking about her. Start doing that and I might start not being bothered. I, I swear, it's like you want to write my story or something. Your story is Julie's story. By what reasoning? You tell me. You knew her for as long as almost anyone except her family and Rachel. You and her go way back. You're linked. You're part of her story. And quite frankly, Julie's story is the community's story now. And you're part of it, like it or not. Are we on the same page about this or, or am I missing something? I was told you'd cooperate with me, but you don't seem all that interested. You know, her father warned me it might be like this. Ha! Who? Walter? What the hell does that piece of shit know about any of this? Apparently a lot more than what you're willing to share. Yeah, and it's probably all wrong. I doubt that. Really skeptical. That, that's gonna get you a long ways. I hope you don't plan on staying in journalism after this is done. How long did they contract you for, anyways? That's not even remotely any of your business, nor is my opinion about any of this or anyone involved in it, including you. I'm here to tell Julie's story, nothing more. 
Now we can sit here and have a civil conversation over wonderfully sweetened tea, or I can leave and I'll fill in the blanks of your part later. Maybe I'll start with the part about you being questioned by the police during the investigation. Sound fair? Don't be a bitch. Yeah, well, they're not paying me anything extra for being nice. So, do you want to talk or not? I'm not going to play catch all day. Catch? <laughs> Is that what we're doing here? We are, and I'm not interested. See? I keep throwing questions at you, and you catch them and throw them right back. I don't need more questions. I've got enough of those, thank you very much. What I need are answers. Answers about you. You and Julie. Your time together at Syracuse and your time after you left New York. Because there is something there. You weren't questioned after she was killed for shits and giggles. And for a dude who lives in Fresno freaking California, you've sure racked up the frequent flyer miles to SeaTac and rental car company records show you don't stay at the airport on all your trips up. In fact, quite often, your destination is Olympia. Why could that be? I didn't fly all the way down here to entertain you while you're being evasive. If you're not going to talk, I'll start digging. I can be damned determined. Jesus Christ. I'm so sick of this shit. Sick of what? This shit. I, I swear, the shit you do in college, man, fuck that. Tell your listeners too, for all I care. If they're dudes, they need to watch out. Tell them yourself. If I use this audio, they'll hear it from your own lips. I, I don't care. They can hear it. You can use it. It's bullshit, man. I was a fucking kid then. We all were. And some bad shit happened to Julie, and suddenly everyone's up in your business. You can't live shit down in America anymore if you're a white dude. Tell your listeners that. Tell them that. Like I said, you're doing that for me. So you're obviously bothered by all this. What is it? Julie's death, the accusations thrown around about you, your marriage, what? How do you know about my marriage? I didn't. Not until I started to put things together. That's what I do, Caleb. I watch, and I listen, and I record. There's a reason I keep my ear to the ground. You learn a lot that way. Is that why Stacy left? Because of Julie? That's none of your fucking business. What happened between me and my wife hasn't got shit to do with any of this, and it sure as hell doesn't belong on your podcast. I disagree. I think it has a lot to do with Julie and has a lot of value on the podcast. Why? Because the losers who listen to this kind of shit are going to get off on hearing the dirty details? No thanks. You don't know shit about what happened, not what really happened, and I'm warning you, you go and make up shit and I'll sue your ass and whoever you're working for. As you can see, I don't have shit to lose. How about you? He was right, of course. I had a lot more to lose than he did. But that's about all he was right about. Caleb was a desperate man, strung out on hopelessness in a swirling world of chaos and disorientation, navigating his way the best he could into a newly single life. So I gave him a little time, left my card, and told him where I was staying, should he find himself in my side of Fresno. I hadn't planned on making that trip more than an overnighter, but Caleb was proving to be an interesting study, and I wasn't ready to head back to Olympia just yet. Thankfully, I'd booked the room for longer than I needed, a trick I'd picked up in my early days of doing this type of stuff. So my schedule was flexible, and honestly, I was enjoying the sun. I didn't mind staying away from Olympia for a few more days if I had a legitimate excuse. Trust me, if you were from here, you'd understand too. You see, Caleb wasn't ready at that point to admit to some of the things I'd already dug up on him. I was just waiting for him to open the box for me to peer inside to see what else he might be hiding. His story is intertwined with Julie's. They go all the way back to that first night at Syracuse. The night I was told, he assaulted her. But that wasn't accurate, as I later discovered. We'll get to that. Don't worry. Suffice it to say that they dated, and later, he and Julie had an affair. 
We're all adults and everyone understands these things happen. However, Caleb seemed incredibly motivated to convince me that he was not at fault for anything that happened between him and Julie and that any ties between them were speculation on my part. What he failed to understand was that, one, I didn't care about what two consenting adults did, and two, what he and Julie did wasn't without ramifications. But that is something we need to get to later. After doing that dance with Caleb, I wanted to call Walter and update him on the story. Ms. Johnson? Hi, Walter. Do you have a few minutes? Yeah, I do. Let me turn off this damn TV. Just watching the game. Sorry about that. So, what can I do for you? I'm down in Fresno. I went to visit Caleb. Walter? Did I lose you? Tell me you didn't hang up on me again. No, I'm here. I'm sorry about that. The last time we chatted. Just... I'm getting old. I can't deal with some of the thoughts I have. When I was younger, I could, no problem. It was easy back then to want to rip someone's face off. I used to rage all the time especially when I had a few Budweiser's in me. But I'm getting old and lost interest in that fight and stuff. But that boy? Well, let me just tell you, it's real easy to get upset when I think about him. He didn't tell me a lot, Walter. As a matter of fact, he basically kicked me out of his house. Really now? Why is that? You prying into all that shit he refuses to admit to doing? Walter... Can I ask you to talk about Julie's time at Syracuse and what happened between the two of them? I know I'm asking for a lot. And I know it's only been a few years since Julie's death and what I'm asking for might be too raw, but Walter, I want to do this right for your daughter. And I can't do it alone. What happened when she was at school is very important to her story and no one wants to talk about it. I'm worried, Walter. About what? That if I don't get Julie's story from you, I'm not going to get it at all. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Okay, what? You'll talk to me? Yeah. About everything? If I can, Miss Johnson. If I can. Can we talk about that night? The night Julie went to the party and met Caleb? You want to talk about the first time he raped her? What? Oh, I imagine Caleb didn't tell you about that, did he? But, Walter, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're making it sound like... You're... Are you implying Caleb raped her multiple times? Ain't no implying about it. That's exactly what I'm saying. Walter didn't stop there. Not even close, but... (sighs) I'm a woman. I may just be some influential blogger conveying Julie's story to those of you who care to hear it, but I'm still a woman. And, And to hear the father of a sexual assault survivor talk like he did... It, even now, looking back on that conversation, it's difficult to think about. Walter shared things about Julie's experience that, quite frankly, haunted him. They were disturbing and upsetting, even to me, an unbiased person nosing around in Julie's life. But Walter was wrong about a few critical things. Things I couldn't wrap my head around until much later because of the disconcerting events he shared later in that conversation. (sighs) So, I'm going to share that with you next time. Right now, I just need to take a break and breathe and think about Walter. He wasn't right about everything. He made assumptions and placed blame where it didn't belong, but... 
He did it out of love and hurt, not malice. He was an older man, alone in a cold, selfish world. And he was hurting. Next time on Who Killed Julie, we'll talk about what happened between Julie and Caleb, both during their time at Syracuse and later back here in Olympia. Be sure to tune in two weeks from now for the fourth installment of Julie's story, the story of us. You've been listening to Who Killed Julie. I'm Emerald Johnson. Thank you for listening, and as always, keep questioning. Who Killed Julie is written and edited by Paul Sading. You can find more about me and my books and other audio drama podcasts, my writing podcast, over at paulsading.com. It is produced and sound designed by the excellent Dog and Pony Studios in Las Vegas, Nevada. They are also the company that produced the second season of Subject Found. You can find them at dogandponystudios.net. Emerald Johnson was played by the one and only, the absolutely wonderful and highly talented audiobook narrator, Ashley Litzy. You can find more about Ashley, her work, and her services over at deepcurvesahead.com. Angela Morrison was Robin Siegerman. You can find Robin and her books over at robinsegerman.com. Rachel Leonard is the one and only Rihanna McAfee. You can find her on twitter.com forward slash re McAfee. John McLean of Dog and Pony Studios played Walter McLemore. You can find him at dogandponystudios.net. Christopher Rocco, Olympia based actor, played Caleb Haskins. You can find Caleb's live performances by checking out the schedule at oletheater.com. And Lauren Wisniewski played the customer in episode two. She's a wonderful voice actor who you can find at lawofalltrades.wordpress.com. I want to give a special thanks to Amy Joy Hilt, who beta read for this podcast, volunteered her services, and really helped me tweak it to make sure that it was ready and appropriate for the material. Amy is a teacher in England and sometimes writer, and I want to thank Amy for her help. This show wouldn't have been what it is without her. If you want to find more about my stories, if you want exclusive stories, if you want insights, special posts, live messaging, early and exclusive access, stories that no one else is going to hear, and you really like what I'm doing with Who Killed Julie, you want to see the second part of this series happen, become a patron. Go over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading, pick a reward level that works for your budget, and the exclusives that you want and help me start funding the next show in this series. You can also find this show, paulsating.com forward slash who dash killed dash Julie, where you can find all of the wonderful actor bios. It's on Libsyn, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play. The show is also on Facebook and Twitter, as am I. You can find me at Paul Sating or at who killed Julie. The artwork is done by the wonderful Kessie Rolinicki, who does all of my book covers and podcast covers. And of course, that music that is absolutely perfect for this show was done by none other than John Eric Guzman of Dog and Pony Studios. Thank you for your download and your listen. Please tell a friend about the show. Please help us spread this important message, this important story, Julie's story, the story of us. Music in these credits is provided by Richard Temple.